We're going to go ahead and get started here with the Santa Cruz Metro Board of Directors meeting for uh, May 17th. And uh, we'll begin with a roll call, please. Director Baltor. Here. Director Kaufman Gomez. Present. Director Gonzalez. Present. Director Leopold. Director Lind. Director Myers. Director Matthews. Here. Director McPherson. Director Pegler. Here. Director Rothwell. Here. Director Rutkin. Here. Ex officio Director Northcutt. Here. Officio Director Preston. We have quorum. Thank you. All right, we have uh, Carlos Landaveri with us today for a Spanish interpretation. Carlos, if you can give us a brief little introduction, that'd be appreciated. Good morning, directors. Carlos Landaveri, your interpreter. Para las personas que hablan español, pueden obtener un aparato de la mesa junto, acá enfrente, junto a la mesa de interpretación. Póngalo en el canal cero y asegúrese que el aparato esté frente a la pantalla. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Thank you, Carlos. And today's meeting is being broadcast by Community Television of, of Santa Cruz by Mr. Uh, our technician today is Mr. Lynn Dutton. And in Watsonville, our technician today is Mindy Esquada. Okay, so thank you. Uh, any board of director comments? Yeah, I, I just like to make one that on um, <laughs> May 25th and 26th, the mural, the existing mural at the Metro Center, will the refurbishing will start on that day for the existing mural. So that that's going to be exciting to see that get uh, refurbished. That's good news. We've been talking about that for quite a while. So great. I'm glad we're moving forward on that. Go ahead, Trina. Uh, yes, uh, last week the t the clock tower at the station um, had no clocks, but now we have them. And considering we don't even have any clocks for clock towers in Watsonville, it's good to see them back. Hopefully we'll get an accurate time more than two times in 24 hours um, so that everybody knows uh, what's going on with the times and as, as a bus um, activity happens in that uh, section of town. Thank you. Any other comments? Okay, we'll move on to uh, oral communications to the board. Anybody that would like to address the board of directors on something that is not on the agenda, please come up. Welcome. Thank you. Brian Peoples with Trail Now, Executive Director of Trail Now. We support Santa Cruz Metro. We actually believe it's very important for our community. Um, we support it, Measure D. Actually, we didn't support it until they took the train funds and reallocated it to Metro and then we supported it. So we're a big supporter of, of Metro. Having said that, we do not support Metro's objection or goal to keep the coastal corridor exclusive to government-run transit. Um, there are three primary corridors for transportation in our community, Highway 1, Soquel, and the Coastal Corridor. The Coastal Corridor, from the study, could have 800 people an hour use the corridor with it as a transportation trail. It's equivalent to a s half of a single highway lane. This will reduce traffic congestion and will open up the roads for Metro. The California Transportation tra is saying the same thing. We're talking to them. They want to know why their tax dollars, the money that was used to purchase the corridor, is uh, not being used for real transportation. It's being used for an excursion train. CTC wants the plan of how you're going to use this property. The RTC has closed the corridor, and the state wants to know why. The debate has moved to the state level, and that's not good for our community. We should be working together as a benefiting, making our community better. When we're going out there and talking at the state level and the federal level, they're questioning this, these local agencies. How are you using our money? They want to know how you're spending our money. We have the community support. We have the farmers. We have over 10,000 signatures. Measure L showed that the community supports using the corridor today for transportation. $1.6 million a year is being taxpayers, Santa Cruz taxpayers, are being used to fund the excursion trains. That's equivalent to eight articulating buses 
That's a waste of our tax dollars. The California Transportation Commission wants to know. They're actually, actually holding back, threatening to hold back funding, and that's not good for our community. $15 million this is being allocated to upgrade the tracks for excursion trains. $15 million of our tax dollars. We ask you to open up the corridor. Don't make it exclusive for government-operated transit. We need to open that up today, and we're hopeful that you start working with the community. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, anyone else like to address board of directors? Rockman. Yeah. Oh, hang on a second. Mayor Hirsch, you're not going to welcome us to Watsonville. I, I, I feel a little left out. If <laughs> well, well, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, Lowell Hurst, uh, welcome to Watsonville. You know, I think public transportation is extremely important, and I think we should have more of it and rather than less of it. I think we should have governmental-funded transportation. And we should have user-funded uh, uh, transportation as well. And I don't object to tourists coming around either. I think tourism is a very important part of uh, the economy in our area. And so whatever we can do to promote tourism is probably a good thing because that's going to make more money available all over the place. And so, welcome to Watsonville. Thank you for being here today, and thank you for your good work. Thank you, sir. Director Rodkin. I have a question. A member of the public alleges that we are in support of uh, exclusive, uh, quote, exclusive uh, transit use on the corridor. Is that the position of the transit district, or are we in support of the uh, combined rail trail that we voted on earlier? We have, we have never said we think we should be exclusively on that corridor. Thank you. Okay, anyone else from the public? We'll go ahead and close that. Uh, move on to written communications from the MAC. Any? Okay, uh, this is time for labor organizations, communications. Anyone from labor like to speak to us today? Not seeing none, we'll move on. Additional documentation, uh, any additional documentation today? We have some here. Yeah. Oops, pressed the wrong button. Sorry. In addition to the news clips, which you get every meeting, you have a revised uh, 914. We have one additional MAC member that resigned, so we'll have two seats to fill. Okay. Great. All right, that brings us to the consent agenda. These are items that are normally dealt with all in one vote. Is there anyone on the uh, board that would like to pull anything from the consent agenda? Is there anyone in the public that would like to address any item on the consent agenda? Mr. Longinati, come on up. Hi, my name is Rick Longinati. I'm with the Campaign for Sustainable Transportation. Yeah. We're not going to start your time yet, okay? Okay, Until great. we get... Uh... Perfect. Great. Yeah, I thought we had. Good morning, everybody. Oh, yeah, thank you. This will advance the slides. Let's see. Great. Okay, so um, this is the message and request this morning is to ask the consultant for the bus on shoulder to consider options that don't assume... Uh, construction of auxiliary lanes. So this is a, a, a map from the bus on shoulder feasibility study, which was completed last year. And it shows in the red that the potential sites for bus on the right shoulder and in the blue on the left shoulder or the median, there's lots of opportunity there. And as you're driving down the highway, this is kind of what I do when I'm driving down the highway. I look at uh, all the, w the width of the highway and see where a bus might fit. Um, the, the current plan is to uh, do bus on auxiliary lane, or, uh, and that means you've got to spend approximately $100 million for the auxiliary lanes first, and then the additional cost is $8 million. Um, the study that was completed last year considered a bus on the right shoulder in a southbound direction between Morrissey and Freedom Boulevard, and that was $12 million. You don't have to have auxiliary lanes for that. Uh, they didn't study money for the northbound lane because the assumption of that study was that the auxil auxiliary lanes were built. So the reason they priced this out is they considered this an interim strategy. Um, we don't know either whether their bus on medium, actually the Metro has expressed a preference in some areas for the bus on the median, uh, but we don't know how much that would cost. Or do we know what the cost of new buses for express service might be? So. 
Uh, auxiliary lanes won't reduce congestion. We've heard from the Highway 1 EIR that in the southbound corridor in the PM peak hour, the auxiliary lane alternative was slightly worse in traffic operations. They're talking about the, the next segment here. That's from SoCal the 41st, slightly worse in traffic operations. We also know it won't improve safety. This is also from the EIR, total accident rates overall and by segment in 2035 under the TSM alternative would be the same as the accident rates for the no build alternative. So the disadvantages of a bus in auxiliary lane means that the bus will get stuck in that traffic that moves into the auxiliary lane. It misses the opportunity for a median bus only lane. It'd be, be built piecemeal, years of construction. It would end at State Park Drive, only five miles from Morrissey Street, uh, instead of going all the way to Freedom Boulevard and beyond. And it wastes precious local transportation dollars on ineffectual auxiliary lanes. So. Um, this is the request to ask the consultant to consider options that don't assume construction of auxiliary lanes. I want to mention, since I have a moment left, that um, so there's a lawsuit against Caltrans that s says that uh, Caltrans EIR did not fulfill the requirements of CEQA by examining alternatives. They didn't, they didn't in that EIR examine bus on shoulder. They didn't examine transit on the rail corridor or, or, best, or better bus service on SoCal and Freedom. So we think a judge is likely a judge will say, no, you got to examine these alternatives and we'll in invalidate that EIR, meaning more delay. So uh, we're hope you can go ahead and wrap up your thought. Yeah, we're hopeful that the RTC will see the light that the auxiliary lanes don't benefit Watsonville, Aptos or anybody and we'll do the bus on shoulder. Thank you. Thank you for that presentation. Anyone else like to speak on anything on the consent agenda? I'll bring it back for action. Uh, uh, Mr. Chair, I just want to say thanks uh, to the Regional Transportation Commission for its cooperative effort in looking at this uh, bus on shoulder. It's been uh, a really good relationship uh, that uh, might solve some big problems for us, I think. And I just want to say thanks. Hats off to RTC. And uh, we'll just keep moving forward. I think we're all optimistic about the potential there. Okay, with that, uh, is there an action? Move approval of the consent agenda. I'll Please. second. Motion by Rodkin. Was there any comment you wanted to make on other, other comment on the consent? Okay. Motion by Rodkin, second by Kaufman Gomez. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? That motion carries unanimously. Yeah. <coughs> it's on bottom, your, bottom left. It's on the, it's on the pan. It's on the screen. Okay. I can't see the button. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned there were a couple of resignations from MAC, and my recollection is that we try to achieve some categories. I know one of those is from the Cabrillo student. Can, and aside from, I know they're, I believe they're not required to be, but we're looking for some diversity. What's the other category, or is there, is it just an at-large? I'm sorry, I haven't evaluated that yet, unless Gina knows that off the top of her head. I think what we'll do is we'll prepare that for when we go to the ad hoc committee to talk about where the where the voids would be relative to your policy. Yeah, and just let us know when you figure out yeah. generally what you're looking for. Absolutely. That's it. Yeah, yeah. And, and the important point there too for me is, is <coughs> as much as possible if the board can help us find candidates, yeah. that would yeah. be great. Mm -hmm. Okay, Done. okay, good, thank you. All right, uh, it takes us to our regular agenda, and we're going to begin with um, longevity awards. We have two to give out today. Um, Cyril, I'm going to ask you to come up to the uh, microphone. And we're introduce, uh, this is uh, George Felder, a bus operator, been here for 35 years. Is Mr. Felder here with us today? Yes, come he on is. up. You could tell us a little bit about Mr. Felder, then we'll turn the microphone over to him. Absolutely. Before I start, I would like to have Anna Marie Gouvet, who's been his direct supervisor for a number of years, to step up. Uh, I'm sure she has quite a number of uh, stories to tell about Mr. Felder. Absolutely. <laughs> In 35 years, I hope there's some stories. <laughs> I'm sure there's more than, <laughs> well, we won't go there. Anyway, <laughs> I want to introduce to you George Felder. We are celebrating the decades of, ser decades of service that uh, George has provided to the community uh, as a bus operator. Uh, I believe he started in 1984, has operated a bus in a variety of routes throughout the community. Um, I guess from my own standpoint, I would just like to say that uh, I've never had a concern about his attendance. He's always there. 
every single day and more so on weekends and his days off. Um, he's been very committed, dedicated. Uh, I received nothing but uh, positive comments about his performance throughout and it is just a pleasure to have him uh, reach a, a pinnacle in his career to the degree that he can now uh, retire and uh, uh, celebrating the number of years that he's had in service also. So uh, again, congratulations. Thanks. <laughs> I've got a lot of great things to say about George, um, but I'll try and keep it short. I've worked with George as a co-worker for 19 years. Um, he has always been the person to look up to. Uh, like Ciro said, he comes to work not just five days a week, sometimes seven days a week. He's, he's a very dependable operator. After 35 years, you would think that people would come to work and just like, okay, let's get this over with. George comes to work every morning with a smile on his face, happy to be part of Metro and, you know, basically serve the community as he has been for 35 years. He's, he's really an amazing operator and we're happy to have had him for this long. Yeah. Step, up to the, step up to that microphone and give us a few words. I didn't know you guys cared like that, but I appreciate it. <laughs> uh, I'd like to uh, thank the district um, for this opportunity to, uh, to have a career here. Uh, now that I'm at the uh, sunset of that, uh, I've had a uh, great time working with some great people. And, uh, you know, it's not a whole, really a whole lot of other to say is that, like I said, I enjoy my work. And I enjoy the people I work with. And uh, it's been fun. <laughs> Thanks. And our next uh, recipient is uh, Freddie Rocha. Been here 15 years. Freddie with us today. Come on up, Freddie. <laughs> Ciro, tell us a little bit about Freddie. Sure. <clears throat> Freddie actually started his career kind of in an um, inordinate way with Metro, and that was actually working on the Discovery charter buses during, uh, after the 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake. Uh, he was there in 98, and I guess it was during the period of time that we were chartering the buses for the Highway 17 service over the hill. Uh, he started his career here at Metro in 2004, and he started as a mechanic one. He later proceeded to promote to a lead mechanic, then on to a supervisor, then on to an assistant uh, fleet and um, facilities manager, and now he is the interim facility manager for Metro. And very, very proud of his success, and he's uh, very reliable and a right hand for me, too. If you were great. So, uh, I've been here 15 years. I've worked along with many, many great people. I've, you know, gathered some of their knowledge, and I'm just so grateful to be part of this Metro family, which, like I said, over the years, it's been, you've had, you know, pleasure of working with many people that are have left, retired, passed away, sadly, you know. But uh, from all those people, I've, over the years, I've, you know, gathered a little bit of knowledge and eventually hope one day to pass some of that knowledge to, you know, other people that I currently work with. So I'm grateful to be part of the Metro family. We have one more uh, recipient. We have a resolution of appreciation for retiree Justina uh, O'Hagan. 
Justina here today? Justina's not here today. Okay. I, I'll move approval of the uh, resolution, however. Motion by Rodkin. Second. Second by Kaufman Gomez. And I have a comment. And a comment. Um, I really feel uh, strongly about making sure that we're um, acknowledging them, not only just here at the dais with our, our particular meeting, but let us know on the, the website for the Metro, perhaps a, a photo, a bit of recognition, maybe a, a comment or so, especially since it's a positive comment for what the Metro is doing with the staff. And especially in light of us trying to do recruitment, these kind of testimonials and, and you know appreciations and, acknowledg and acknowledgments might be beneficial for the public that may have an interest or curiosity about working for the Metro so that they know and hear from um, some of the positive experiences that our staff have. If we could do something like that, I think that would help. Great suggestion, thank you. Any other comments? With that, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? That motion carries unanimously. Take us to uh, item 12, introduction of new fixed route and paracruise operators, Anne-Marie Govea. New people, we love it. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, my name is Chris Sullivan. I'm a supervisor at Metro Paracruise. Um, good morning. Good morning. How is everybody? Um, it's been my uh, given uh, my honor to introduce, uh, well, four are here, new uh, Paracruise operators. Uh, one person is absent, but uh, so a total of five. And um, introduce them and uh, welcome them to the Metro family. So, um, I just wanted to mention uh, briefly that we were driving over here this morning and I was uh, mentioning the positive aspects of working at Paracruise. And one of the things that came up was um, the positive uh, stuff we get from the, our riders, that everyone's very appreciative of the rides they get and uh, how a lot of times they comment that if it wasn't for us, they couldn't get to their doctor's appointment or go to shopping or they have no family in the area. When many people say they don't want to burden their family. And so the service allows people to live their life in the uh, most, um, the best way they can. And um, hopefully five new operators will add to our success and our on-time performance. And so as I said, we have four here. Uh, one person had the day off. Her name's Jennifer Courtright. So, um, but I'll let these, these four come up and introduce themselves. And um, I'm proud to say we have five new operators on. And uh, I think Fixed Route has one. So yay, Pear Cruz. Congra <laughs> congratulations. Um, anyway, so please. Step Sarah. up. I'm Sarah Hewitt. And I'm a new hire. I've been driving, I think, on my own about a month. And I'm enjoying the uh, customer service aspects. I really do enjoy uh, driving I never thought I would be in this type of career and I have enjoyed learning about the company and Metro and uh, I and I do enjoy the the personal aspect with the clients and um, taking them to appointments trying to get there on time and every day is a new day uh, with Paracruz and um, thank you for you know hiring me and uh, I hope to uh <laughs> 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 so I'm enjoying my new career thanks for your service good morning my name is Juan Alberto Serrano I'm a new hire I started driving about a month uh, by myself and I'm enjoying this kind of work uh, better than anything I did before. I want to thank you for the opportunity that you guys gave me and uh, doing my best, trying to get there on time all the time and uh, trying to make a bet metro a better place for everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Rodrigo Mojica. Um, I enjoy working for Metro. It's probably the best job I've ever had. And, you know, thank you guys for hiring us and we'll try to make it better for everyone to get to their appointments or uh, where they need to get to be. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. 
Good morning, my name is Anthony Fry, and I am happy to be with Metro. Thank you very much. Um, I share Sarah's uh, um, interest in providing the service for folks and enjoy the recognition that, that they offer when we're, when we're uh, providing the service. So it's, it's very uh, rewarding to be able to do that. Thank you very much. Thank you all. We're happy to have you on board. Good luck. Yes, Alta, please. No, go ahead. <laughs> Am I on? I want to um, acknowledge and applaud you all for joining a marvelous team and thank you for your interest and um, potential with the company. I have worked with Cabrillo for about 19 years. I'm in my 19th year. And I used to work with students with disabilities and we relied heavily on um, <laughs> Paracruz. And I'm saying over the years, it has been such a a wonderful experience to see it becoming very rider friendly and I want to thank you for that I want to thank you in advance for the service that you're going to be providing to not just clients but students for community members who are getting everywhere in this um, community that they need to be and so I thank you in advance for your service I thank you for the potential that you have to touch the lives of many writers and people and make a difference in their life sometimes it's just a smile sometimes it's a hi and thank you for choosing us and so I just want to remind you of that in advance <laughs> because I have relied with uh, I have used Paracruz in my service to students and I just want to thank you for your dedication already to this work seeing you smile after a month makes a difference <laughs> thank you well said director Northcutt thank you thank you very much okay that'll take us to uh, item 13 our CEO report mr. Clifford I'd like to start off by introducing a new director. As the board knows uh, and has shared with me, uh, our mutual desire to have a marketing and communications function here at this agency, and, and it's been a struggle. A number of years ago, you approved a position, uh, but we were in a budgetary crisis, and we couldn't fill it for a, a number of years. And uh, we finally had the opportunity to do that, thanks to your support. Um, we haven't had that function here in many, many years, and, and I really want to say kudos uh, for all the good work that, that our management and others have done uh, through the years to provide some limited amount of marketing and communications so that we could communicate to the public and uh, um, share the good things that Metro is doing. But now we have the opportunity to have a dedicated person here, and I'm going to introduce Jamie Ackman. And Jamie, if you wouldn't mind standing up, I'm going to read a little bit to the board about you. Uh, Jamie joins Metro with more than 20 years of experience as a communications professional, both on the Central Coast and throughout the Bay Area. Jamie launched her career in television journalism, working as a producer and reporter for KSBW before eventually transitioning from journalism to public relations. After working in high-tech PR, Jamie joined the San Mateo County Transit District as the public information officer and uh, for its three agencies, Samtrans, Caltrain, and the San Mateo County Transportation Authority in 2001. Seeking promotional opportunities, she later joined VTA as the communications manager responsible for managing the team and handled electronic customer media, uh, community, community, community communications, internal communications, and outreach. Later, she rejoined Samtrans, Caltrain, and the, uh, and the TA, becoming the director of marketing and customer service. Most recently, Jamie worked for an investor-owned utility, San Jose Water Company, as the director of corporate communications. Jamie has lived in Ben Lomond for nearly 15 years with her husband, Dean, a retired San Jose police sergeant, and their two daughters, Cassie, a sophomore at South Southern Methodist University in Dallas, and Zoe, uh, a freshman at San Lorenzo Valley High School in Felton. Please join me in welcoming Jamie to the team. Thank you for that warm welcome, and uh, thank you for making me part of the team. I um, love working in public transportation. I think that there's uh, 
a real joy in working in a service where you are directly interacting with your customers and seeing the real benefits of what you do every day. So I'm proud to be here, and I'm also proud to be working in an organization that serves the community that my neighbors, my children, uh, and uh, my family have benefited from over the years. So thank you for having me. Welcome, Jackie. Thank you. And Mr. Chair, uh, it's always a, a special welcome for me uh, having a fifth district San Lorenzo <laughs> Valley person uh, <laughs> be a big part of uh, Metro. And uh, I know that she has represented a bigger agency, but this is a step up. I, we really welcome you. I think you're going to do a great job, and we need your services seriously. <laughs> Other comments? Well, just a, just a District 5 plug, and that was good, okay, so. <laughs> and Mr. Chair, if I might just continue on a couple of other items. Um, as usual, we like to welcome uh, new, new uh, hires and promotions. We have a new hire. We hired Rick Jimenez. He's our new purchasing assistant slash buyer. Uh, we already introduced uh, Jamie. And then we had promotions. Um, I'm happy to report, I think this is a name you know, Michael Rios has promoted from transit supervisor to assistant training coordinator. I think Michael's in the audience, actually. Yes. Hey, Michael, congratulations. Yeah. And Anson Mayweather promoted from provisional employee to revenue account coordinator. Um, this is a position we've kind of been experimenting with ever since we did the merger of the reservationists and the customer service representatives, uh, and we've been sort of trying to reconstruct and, and rebuild that whole uh, customer service and ticket and fair media section of our organization. And Anson has helped us uh, as a temp employee and then a provisional employee as we developed his position further from what it used to be into its uh, sort of new, uh, new day. And then he became a provisional employee and now he is a permanent employee. So we're happy to have Anson here. He's not in the audience today, but we're, we're glad that he's joining the team now as a permanent employee. And then uh, two other quick things. You no doubt heard that the president met in a bipartisan way to talk about infrastructure, multi-billion dollar program. Everybody's enthusiastic about an infrastructure program. Um, that would be nice. I'm equally as enthusiastic about it, but the word on the street is that's probably not going to go anywhere because you've got to figure out how you're going to pay for such a thing. So it's just con the, the continued uh, uh, jockeying going on uh, in Washington. Um, we'll, we will continue to do our part as our Metro board member team did in Washington, D.C. recently, talking about real programs and the need to find real funding to fund those programs. So we'll keep promoting those concepts. And then last but not least, UCSC vote is this week. It is ongoing from uh, the 15th through the 22nd. And of course, this is a measure for the students to consider allocating additional dollars to their uh, transit fee, which includes the funds that pay for the, um, the, the, the ability for us to provide every student on campus uh, the use of our system without paying for the fixed route system. And we hope that that will prevail. I know that's important to the university uh, in what they wish to do and what they wish to continue to fund in Metro services. Any question for the CEO, Mr. Rodkin? I, I just wanted to report that I was able to get the unions that represent about 98% of the faculty at UCSC to make class announcements this week uh, about this vote and to encourage their students. They, they're not telling them how to vote, but they're letting them know that there would be pro cuts to the service if, if it's not voted for and that they need to vote. The last election, did, uh, the majority pretty clear majority of people voted in favor of increasing the funds, but they didn't reach the 25% minimum vote uh, quota to be able to actually have it be an effective election. So getting the students out to vote is the real issue, and hopefully these class announcements will help in that process. Any other questions or comments? Okay, thank you for that report. We'll accept that. Uh, next will be a presentation, uh, Understanding uh, Post-Employment Benefits. Uh, Angela, welcome. Good morning. So the next three presentations are kind of all tied together. Um, okay. I'll be pointing to the uh, some documents that are within the budget presentation, item number 15 on your um, agenda. So let me get to item number 14 here. I'm going to point you to 15C.68. 
Those are some of the numbers that are going to be corresponding to what I'll be talking about on this presentation 14A. So for the next two presentations, we're kind of going back to school. I am not here to tell you this is exactly what's going on. Uh, the reason that we're putting these two presentations together is to try to start walking down the road of education for the staff, for the board members, and for uh, though all of us at Metro as to understanding what our other post-employment benefits are. And it's, uh, we, everybody refers to it as OPED, that's the, the acronym for it. In addition to that, we have what's called our, other, our net OPEB liability, and I'll get into the explanation of what those are. So lots of information here. I'm hoping that you can keep this as a reference document in the future so that if someone has questions, you can hand them this presentation. That's why there's so many words. Um, those of you that see my presentations before, I usually don't have this many words, but it really takes this much to tell you what this is all about. So this, we have two things. This presentation is only on the post-employment benefits, the medical piece of the uh, retiree benefits. This has absolutely nothing to do with the pension piece. That's my second presentation. So there's two separate uh, things that we'll be talking about today. So Santa Cruz Metro provides medical, dental, vision, and life insurance coverage for those qualified retirees in uh, retirement, and that's known as Other Post-Employment Benefits, or OPEP. And we refer to this, in short, also as retiree medical, but it does include the dental, vision, and life insurance. And I'll get into the definitions of when that's included and when it's not. So today we do something called uh, pay-go or pay-as-you-go. So as the funds um, are incurred or expenses are incurred through CalPERS bills, we pay those bills every month. And that's why I was referring you to 15C68. You can see where we have medical insurance, uh, dental insurance, vision insurance, and life insurance. And we have some, um, this is under the Retiree Employment Benefit Department 9005. And those benefits for 2019, we budgeted about $3 million. Um, in 20, we budgeted about $3 million three, and in 20, we're budget budgeting $3.5 million. So, so those are the dollars that go with this one. Um, let's see here. These are for um, the costs that we're incurring today for retirees that we have today. These are not accumulating uh, towards the liability. This is what we are uh, being charged today for the retirees that are, are retired today. Contributions are not made for those um, that are, contributions are only made for retirees today only. They are not for the retiree benefits for um, future. Those are the unfunded pieces. So prior to 19, or 2009, there was no standards. Um, no one had a um, set way of reporting this through either their audits or to their agencies. Everyone reported it completely different or didn't report it at all. So in 2009, something came through our Government Accounting Standards Board called GADSB 45. This established some kind of standard. It wasn't all the standards, but at least it was starting down the road of putting standards in place on how agencies should report this unfunded liability. Um, for the fiscal year ending 2009, we uh, implemented GADSB 45 and we recorded the liability in our financial statements. And this initial Initial required entry was the difference between what we actually calculated as the annual required contribution and the pay-go or pay-as-you-go contribution. Um, these did not require the actuarial liability to be recorded. So the difference was not recorded, it's just what we were paying. So Gatsby 45, here's some more detail about it. Um, we only did it every two years. It was not required every year. And so that became an issue as people were trying to um, get their arms around the uh, liabilities that were out there because people were finding that their liabilities were much larger than they had anticipated. Um, each year until 2018, the Gatsby 45, we used that and we updated our liabilities on our financials. Then in 2018, uh, Gatsby 75 replaced Gatsby 45, and this is a whole, whole bunch of accounting jungle, but uh, what it did is it put even more standards in place, streamlined a lot more things, and now we do it every year. So starting in June 30th of 2018, the year ended June 2018, that was our fiscal year 18, we now um, have 
the Gatsby 75 in place and we will be doing the actuarials every year. So as I was saying, Gatsby 75 requires annual actuarial evaluations instead of biannual, um, which 45 did. They do not mandate pre-funding of the liabilities, which on one hand is good and on the other hand it's not so good. Um, some agencies have decided even though it's not required, they are pre-funding uh, their liabilities or trying to put more funding to, towards their current liabilities. So 75 caused extensive and significant changes to the accounting treatment and the terminology that we use in our financial reporting. And it also has required disclosures in there that tells you exactly what we're doing and why. And those will be coming through on, you, know, you would see that in our audits that we bring through every fall. You can't see this online, but uh, look on your, your uh, packets. This is where I was saying um, medical, we call it retiree medical, but um, at certain point, the uh, dental vision and life is included. So just to kind of go through this a little bit, on the first column is management, second column, I apologize, smart, um, we need to change that to smart paracruise, SCIU, and smart fixed route. Going on down, the benefit type provided for retirees is medical. And this medical is good until you are 65. When you reach the age of 65, uh, Santa Cruz Metro's medical becomes secondary to um, Medicare. Thank you. <laughs> Everybody else knows that. You're not old enough to know, but no, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> some of us, we know exactly what you're <laughs> I will get there, I'm sure. So Santa Cruz medical, um, plan is primary until you reach that age and then it becomes secondary. Your Medicare takes over and then uh, our medical comes in secondary. This is for your lifetime. The benefit is for the lifetime for all uh, four units. Uh, this benefit becomes available to someone at Santa Cruz Metro after they have put in five years of service. And again, this is medical only. Um, when you reach the age of 50 is when you can take advantage of this uh, benefit and retire from Santa Cruz Metro. And it also has dependent coverage. So it's not just for the employees, for the retirees, uh, the, be the beneficiaries of the retiree also. For the first two groups, it's paid in 100%. And in SEIU and SMART fixed route, it's paid at 95. This, is this has been negotiated through the years. Um, that 100%, 95% is based on the Blue Shield HMO plan. So we have a, I'm going to call it a menu of medical plans that our employees and retirees have uh, the options to choose from. And uh, through the CalPERS resolution that we have, uh, the Blue Shield HMO plan is the plan that this 100% and 95% is based on. Once you reach 10 years of service and you retire and you are 50, that's when the dental vision and the basic life kick in, in addition to the medical. And the same uh, pieces um, apply. It is for all your dependents also. It, and uh, Santa Cruz Metro pays 100% of those premiums. But the difference here is that when you reach uh, 65, those three benefits go away. Your medical doesn't go away, it becomes secondary, but the dental vision and the basic life are no longer a benefit. Any questions on that? I know there's a lot of information. You might want to clarify that 50 is the minimum age at which you could retire. You're not required to retire at that point. Correct. And we don't encourage it generally. Oh, no, there's, <laughs> you could never retire. There is no requirement to retire from Santa Cruz Metro. We have certain levels that you can retire. Uh, we have, uh, two at 50, we have two and a half at 55, and we have two at 62. So it just depends on when you started and how old you are and all the different factors that go into retirement. On to this one. So taking that information, medical only, not taking the dental uh, vision and life into consideration. In 2008, we saw that those under 65 who were retired we paid $1.4 million towards the medical costs for retirees only. And those that are over 65, even with the supplemental piece, we paid almost a million five. And then there was about $150,000 worth of individual retirees that we don't know what their age was. And it gives you a, a, a picture snapshot of how much this is. Bigger piece here, and this is what we have been paying every year since 2008 towards um, the 
OPEB retirement uh, medical piece. <coughs> so we, uh, in 2008, paid a million five. Going all the way up to 2018, we've paid th uh, three million. In 19, for our budget, we've budgeted 3.1. In 20, we've budgeted 3.3. And in 21, we've budgeted 3.5. Uh, I just have a quick question about that. Uh, w didn't we also see a large amount of retirements um, in the last four or five years? We I mean, did. The part, part, part of our cost saving was trying, was encouraging retirements of Correct. some of our older employees. And you can see that in 16 and 17, where those went up significantly more than 15, and then we came back down in 18. This is also based on, I hate to say it, uh, the morbidity rate, you know, how long people live. And so, uh, obviously, in 2018, we had less people, less retirees that we paid for than we did in 17 and 18. So it's a combination of how many we had retire and how many uh, were no longer on the books. Quick question here. A Angela, can you give us an idea of how many employees no longer working for Metro that this um, $3 million is being paid towards our benefits? Oh, I'll have to uh, get that number back to you. Okay. Thank you. So GASB 75 is what we have to uh, abide by now for the accounting rules. And this is the one that uh, does the gap between. And in the chart on the bottom, we have the total OPED liability. Right now we're at about $107 million is our liability. And that includes um, employees today that are going to retire and retirees. And so what, what, uh, what we should have been doing is putting money away every year, ever since the very first day someone started working at Metro, and we did not do that. And so we've been paying as we go, as we incur the expenses, and we've been paying those bills out of our operating budget. What should be happening is we should, be putting, we should have been putting money to the side, and this was 25 years, 30 years ago when we should have been doing this, and taking money out of that trust account, not taking it out of our operating budget. Because as you see, it hits our operating budget by $3 million. That $3 million should be coming out of this trust fund over here that uh, we pay to CalPERS every month or, or once a year, if possible. And we incur uh, interest on that. So interest increases uh, the money that we put to the side. So you compound you know, interest, interest. Yes. The, does the liability um, uh, begin when they're high, it, it, in terms of what should be happening in your view? Ha uh, happening when they're hired or after they five years when they actually become uh, vested in the system? So my opinion is day one because you've made a commitment to an employee when they start when HR hands them the packet of here's your benefits. Part of that benefit is here's your retirement that you're being offered when you, re when you start. So from a fiscal responsibility perspective, we should have been putting money over here in, I'm going to continue to say a trust account. There's many options. <coughs> so I'll just call it a trust account for now and putting that money away and earning interest on it. So that by the time that employee retires, we have that money over in the trust account to pay the $3 million, or probably at that time, much, much more out of that account versus our operating account. We have a bigger, a much better handle on our operating expenses since we don't have to worry about retiree expenses coming through. Thanks. Yeah, uh, I'd like to ask just another qu question. Sure. Um, it, it was very common to do the pay go um, uh, so we weren't out of at a step with other agencies in doing that. How much money would we need to have in the trust fund to pay a three million dollar annual bill? Well, our bill is one hundred and seven. It's three million dollars a year to pay right now. We 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 literally take three million out of our <laughs> operating budget right now. No, I, I understand our liability, but oh, uh, but it, it, but if, if if what you're saying, if we had a trust fund, if if as you say, being f fiscally responsible to have a trust fund, how much would we need in that trust fund in order to pay out three million dollars a year? Well, um, yeah, I mean, I mean, I, I, that, that that's my point. Because you have ebbs and flows, so someone starts today as a new employee, and three years from now they leave. Well, they've contributed or we've contributed for them into this trust account for Metro to eventually pay uh, retire expenses, correct? So you look at this $107 million, I would not, you know, as I get through the presentation here, that will be my suggestion. We do not 
fund that by $107 million, you fund it about 75% because of the people that don't make it all the way to retirement. I mean, you just saw you got 30-year people, 15-year people, lots of our employees stay a long time. And that's why that 75% may actually increase if you have more people that stay longer. And that would, um, you have certain points through someone's career where you would make some decisions, and it'd be an actuarial report. I mean, I, I am not an actuarial, so I am telling you the information I know from the information that Debbie and Christine and I have tried to put together over the last few years. I don't have a direct answer for you as to how much money I have to have in the bank to come up with a $3 million worth of interest that it would be able to pay every year, but um, I can tell you that we should be having about 75% of that $107 million in there to be solvent and not have to worry about paying $3 million out of our operating budget. Does that? Yeah, yeah I mean, it just, uh, d but the magnitude uh, seems great when you, you have a annual budget that's in the 60 million and what you wrote, you're proposing is another annual budget that might of 60 million to get you the 3 million that you might need for it. I mean, I just, it's, it's a big job. So I'm not proposing a hundred and seven million dollar even 75% of that as a budget. What I am proposing is that we would later create a bucket, a reserve bucket, and we would start putting money towards that so we can get ahead of this. Um, this is kind of like we have a $107 million house loan out there. But the problem is the house may uh, appreciate, but the loan also appreciates. So you don't still have a $107 million loan. You actually might end up with a bigger loan. Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, I think there's l <clears throat> we, we can have a longer discussion. I won't, 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 won't uh, belabor it here. Uh, I don't think it's exactly an apples to apples to calling it uh, like a mortgage. No, uh, I was just I was just uh, trying to point out that a, 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 a tr to have a trust fund to generate the kind of uh, resources necessary at, um, would be quite large. It would um, be, and we we'd be making a bunch of different trade-offs in order to make that work. Yes, we would, and that's why I'm not recommending 107. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Go ahead. At, at one point, um, it might be beneficial. May not may not be in this particular meeting, but this is still a world benefit with our employees. And when when we have the discussion with the employee that says, "Here's your wage, here's your medical, here's what we're providing you with while you're employed with us," this should also be an extra layer for them to know it, and what we can anticipate that they're packaged to be. Because people think that their their wages are sixteen fifty an hour, when really this is on top of that with everything else going on beneficially. So that when they're comparing apples to apples with, okay, I can make sixteen fifty at Metro, or I can make sixteen fifty the mid management somewhere downtown that they need to know that this is this is a big chunk of what their overall benefits are and to f to find out you know at least a couple scenarios of somebody working 25 years retires at 55 maybe somebody at 65 who's been here for 20 or 5 so that they know that um, what kind of investment we're making in them because like you said you don't know the number of employees that we're looking to set aside 3 million dollars for towards this $106 million bill, essentially. And I think employees need to realize that it goes above and beyond uh, the W-2 paycheck you're getting on their benefits. I think the employees are starting to see that. We just did two uh, total compensation studies, one for management and one for SEIU. And so in that total compensation is all the benefits included into just, it used to be just uh, the salary surveys that we did. Now it was total compensation. So I think we've started down that road. Um, I can not, I can say that we have not presented to a new employee or any employee. Um, here's what you receive as ex employee for benefits as well as salary. That might be something that we should consider, but uh, I do think that we have started down that road. Here. Sure. Um, I'm not encouraging anybody to retire, but if have, had Metro not encouraged retirement in that 2000, when we had the spikes in 16 and 17, what would that 18 be? Would it, do you know how much more it would be if we wouldn't, if that wouldn't have occurred? I don't have an answer for okay. that one. Do you have any kind of a guesstimate? I understand that you wouldn't have a flat out figure, but. The longer you stay, the higher the pension. Yeah. That's, that's the bottom line. So if, if uh, they had not retired and they incurred more years, 
then the higher their pension is. There's a sliding scale of percentage. Um, you know, if, if I take the two and a half at 55, you get two two and a half percent of your salary at age of 55. And so, if you go longer, it's two and a half percent of your salary times the numbers of, number of years of service. So, if you put that all together, and, and the people that retired would have added more years of service, theoretically, that number would have gone up. Okay. Continue with your presentation. Could I ask one? Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Director Rothwell. So, in terms of the drift of what you're saying here, are you viewing this as purely informational for their, our benefit, or are you making a specific recommendation as to what we should do? This one is informational. I do have some recommendations in here, but I'm not asking you to take any action today. Okay. Yeah, on this presentation and the next one, it's purely informational, recommendations for you to think about, no action. Thanks for clarifying. <laughs> sure. Okay, where were we? Um, so, yeah. I think I pretty much said everything that's on that slide. Any questions about this slide? All right, moving on to the next one. So in this chart, it shows you the GASP 45 was from 2008 through 2016. That's why it's a two-year increments that we did, because that's what was all, all that was required for GASP 45. In 2018's fiscal year that ended June 30th of 2018, that's when the GASP 75 started. And so uh, we'll be doing that for 19 and 20. You'll be seeing um, lines on here for every single year, but that's how we got to the 107 that I was talking about. So some more information about how we got here. Um, there were no standards. Prior to 2009, people just did whatever they wanted. Um, if they reported out, it was at very high level. And if it wasn't a significant amount, which before I started here 15 years ago, it wasn't <coughs> considered a huge amount. But because of all the um, baby boomers, actually, uh, I think that was 1946, 1964 areas where the baby boomers are considered to, to be, you add 50 years or you add 62 years, <coughs> and uh, they, they started ramping those, those numbers up. So uh, pay as you go. I think I explained to that. There's no pre-funding. You just pay whatever expense CalPERS bill was sent to you every month. Or, um, as we'll be looking at the budget, you pay it once a year and you might uh, save some interest on that. GASB 45, we did that from 2009 to 2018. And then GASB 67, we started doing that um, for fiscal year 18, and we'll be doing that every year going forward. So, again, this, I'm not uh, asking for any action on this. These are some options that uh, we can all consider. So establishing um, an open liability reserve. What this would do is it would put money over in a reserve account so that these kind of um, expenses do not touch our operating budget on a, on a yearly basis. We could revise the reserve policy to include that uh, new OPEB liability reserve. And then these are ones that I know are not popular, but um, I felt it uh, you know, fiscally responsible for me to put it out there. We could work with PERS. We could come up with uh, our current medical plans and possibly make changes. As I had uh, said earlier, we do have kind of a menu of medical plans that the employees have the option to take from as well as the retirees. And we could talk to PERS about possibly changing that, reducing it, whatever, uh, whatever we come up with. Then the next two, negotiate with employees. First one is to negotiate with additional contributions from the employees for the monthly premiums. Uh, as you saw before, two groups are 100% paid by Metro, two groups are 95% paid by Metro. Uh, then we could also negotiate with the employees about terminating the PEMCO agreement and eliminating the retiree medical altogether. Uh, that's a hard one. Uh, we would have to go off and uh, create our own um, medical plans. We'd have to go into a completely different group. Um, I don't know all the details to that, but I do know it is a huge task and that it would probably take us um, quite a while to go through that whole process. Once you terminate with the PEPCO agreement, once you terminate with Cal CalPERS, you cannot go back. It is a once, one decision. If you decide that you no longer want to do it, then you, you can't decide five years, 10 years, 15 years later that you want to go back. Um, we could co uh, contract with the OPEB actuarial, which I um, think this is probably something that we should be doing and uh, go through and find out where do we really stand 
again, Debbie and Christine and I, we are not OPEB actuarials. We do the best we can with the information that we have. But these guys, they're pros at it, and they do it for a living. Uh, there are so many um, factors that if one factor changes, if you change the um, mortality rate of uh, someone living to 90 to only living to 89, even by one year, that will change all of the predictions by a, a pretty big scale. Um, you wouldn't think one year would do something that, that, but it does. It changes it dramatically. We could receive that report and then discuss options back at the board and with the employees and with the unions and see what we want to do. Uh, do we want to set up a trust? Do we want to set up some kind of other plan instead of having all of this coming out of our operating budget every year? Uh, putting out that trust, we could earn potentially more interest than what we have the money in the bank today. Um, setting that up, um, if we did set up a trust, I would recommend setting it up as an irrevocable trust because that is um, a commitment that we've made to the employees and once you put that money in there, it can't be taken back for some other um, situation that uh, Santa Cruz Metro may need it for. We always need money for something and I think once, once if you make this uh, commitment to making this irrevocable trust, then that is a commitment going forward. Um, obviously, you could do nothing. We could put our head in the sand and say, well, we'll deal with it later. Uh, that has never been something I've uh, re recommended to you guys, but it is an option. Oh, one more thing. If you put money into the reserve account, that doesn't get rid of your liability. But if you put the money into the trust account, that does bring your liability down because it's an irrevocable trust and you can't take it back for something else. You have to put that money towards the pension liability. So that's something that CalPERS has put together. So out of all those options, I do have recommendations. The re recommendations are not something I'm asking you to um, um, take action on, but these are some recommendations that I would put forward. So approve the budget, which I'll be going through here, but approve that in, uh, June, and as today, it is uh, offering up $2 million to go into this reserve account. Again, this is a reserve account that's not the trust. It takes us a little while to set up that trust, but at least this will be a baby step towards uh, bringing this $107 million deficit down. Come back to the board with, uh, we do have a reserve policy today, but the reserve policy does not include the OPEB reserve account, so come back with a reserve, um, revised reserve policy. And then uh, research the options of reducing the cost. Those three options that I had up there about negotiating with the unions about uh, the benefits, additional employee contribution, and then the third one, talking to CalPERS about eliminating the agreement. Um, definitely recommend contracting with the actuarial because there's no one on staff that knows this stuff as much as we need someone to know it, and they can help us make some decisions. Um, Review the scenarios that they come back with. They are going to have multiple scenarios for us to look at because, as I said, you change one factor, it changes a lot of, um, changes the outcome dramatically. <coughs> and then uh, establish that pre-fund trust. Um, keep the reserve <coughs> account going, but um, make a conscious decision to put money into that trust or some other kind of mechanism that uh, we put this money into so we have a higher, retain higher return on our assets as well as we are um, making a conscious contribution to bringing that liability down and we're, we're lowering our unfunded liability or our NOL. So this is the glossary to a lot of the terms I use today. This is, again is as a reference document. Uh, there's nothing in here that I'm saying that I want a decision on today but it's just a lot of information to think about and the recommendations um, kind of gives you where um, Alex and myself are thinking that uh, we want to talk more about to the board. Questions on this one? Question, Director Rodkin. Uh, if there's questions first, I have a comment rather than questions. I'll look to questions first and we'll come back. Oh, I, I've got a comment. Any questions? I want to open it up to the public, then we'll bring it back and discuss it. Okay. Go ahead, Director um, Myers. What would be the cost of the working with the, um, the contract with an actual actuary? <laughs> I'm not even going to try to say that word. <laughs> sure. Sure. All right, we know what you're talking about. Um, let's say around five, okay. five thousand. So low it's, cost. It's not thing. a huge amount, but you have to do it every year. So it's and it's something that we would have to, we would budget for. Keep it in. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? Let's go ahead and open. Uh, Mr. Mr. Clifford. 
All right, Mr. Chair, if I might just add a couple of things before you go to comment. Um, ever since this began to be a requirement by GASPI to be reported, as was pointed out, different agencies have handled this in different ways. Some agencies started as long ago as 10 years ago to start beginning to address this. I've talked to a number of my colleagues across the industry nationwide on this topic, and some are now, you know, 10 years later in a position where they're what you would call superfunded. They, they now have the situation under control. They have what Angela has described in place, and they have relieved their operating fund of a great deal of burden. Um, and many others have been doing what we have done, which is the pay as you go. And pay as you go when the liability was low and the impact on your operating fund was, you know, manageable, um, just became something that we accepted in our budget and we just moved on every year and adopted our budget. Um, but what you can see uh, clearly, hopefully, uh, from slide, say, 14A10, look what has happened since 2008. Um, you know, from a $44 million liability, and some of that's related to GASB still changing its requirements on how you capture that information and re record it. But a $107 million <coughs> liability is enormous for an agency this size. Uh, go to slide 14A8, and I know you, you had some concerns about whether or not um, our encouragement for uh, early retirement uh, or taking advantage of retirement incentive a few years ago impacted this. There's no doubt it did adjust the bars up. T take a step back from the individual bars and look what has happened since 2008. The burden on our operating enterprise fund has gone from uh, about a million five now to double that. Follow the curve. Don't worry about the little ups and downs that impact uh, one year's bars. Follow that curve. It is an enormous slope on that curve. It is a scary curve to, to look at. Um, this is a topic we must address. We are now past that time in which we can just say, let's just keep paying as we go. We'll handle the annual liability in our operating fund and we'll push the topic aside for another day, kind of kick the can down the road strategy. Um, we cannot kick the can down the road any longer. Um, in this budget, should you adopt this budget, you have a $2 million commitment to beginning to address this for the first time. So in addition to your pay-as-you-go strategy, which you must continue to do, in the budget, you have a $2 million commitment to begin doing that. Um, the, the devil is in the detail on this, and what, what I will propose, unless you tell me today otherwise and say, no, we don't want to talk about this right now, we want to keep doing what we've been doing, unless you tell me that, um, what I will do is begin a series of discussions in the Finance Committee, the Board Finance Committee. We have the UAL, which you have yet to receive a, a presentation on, the PERS Unfunded Liability, and we have the OPEB. The OPEB is the complicated one, much more complicated than the UAL is, and we'll need to talk about the strategy on how to get there. Um, there is no quick fix. I want to make sure you understand the fix to the OPEB liability um, should we get to a fix, is a multi-year, many-year strategy. There is nothing that you can do today that will suddenly put $3 million back in our operating fund. As we fix this problem, you will see the benefits over many years. This is a long-term strategy for the survivability of this organization to make sure that we plan for 20 and 30 years out and it will take us many years to get there. As I described, some of my colleagues I've talked to, uh, it has taken them 10 years through, through different approaches, and everybody has a different strategy. You can't say, hey, Clifford, tell us what so-and-so agency did, and let's just incorporate that. You can't do that because everybody has a different set of circumstances, uh, depending on whether they are in PERS medical or not uh, impacts what they can do. Um, what their contract is, five or ten years, impacts what they can do. And we still have more research to do in that area on our own organization. Um, so it's a big thing. It'll take a long time. But we must start that conversation. And again, as, unless you tell me otherwise, uh, I'll begin feeding that through the board's finance committee so that we can start setting up what, what is 
you know, evaluation of what the problem is, the magnitude of it is, and what are the options to begin to fix it. Uh, but as Angela said, we have no recommendation today. We're not asking you to do anything that starts that journey other than when you um, send the budget out for public comment that we, we continue to include that initial commitment to beginning to address the problem. So I do have an answer to that question about how many retirees are, need, are in just the two. So in comparison, we have about 320 employees today. Total retirees we have is about 274, of which 86 are on the blue column and 188 are in the orange column. That tells you what happens to our medical when everybody reaches 62. Thank you for that. Hey, I'll, I'll go ahead. Oh, just, a, uh, just a question for Mr. Clifford. You say we're not taking any actions, but we later in this meeting you would be asking us to ad to adopt the first draft of the budget, which has the two million dollar transfer to the OPEB liability reserve. So that is an action, it seems like. In in a separate report, yes. Yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, but action uh, that but we are asking you to do. I don't want to disconnect the, that. Those are. The, it's directly related. Absolutely. Yeah, so. and, and I think Angela tried to set the stage for that because she indicated we have three parts to this sort of rolling presentation. There's the OPEB, the UAL, and then the budget. They all kind of, as you point yeah. out, they do all yeah. kind of flow together, and they're important to link together. Today you won't be taking any action on the budget. <coughs> the only thing you'll be doing is um, adopting the resolution so that we have a public hearing a month from now. So no adoption of the budget today either. And so before I go, go to the public, I'm just trying to follow here. We're, I'm going to take this like item 14A. You just did the OPEBs. And now I'm going to have you go ahead and do B, which is the uh, uh, pension. And then at that point, we'll open up the public on 14 for comments before we go to 15, even though you're rolling all three. So continue with uh, 14B then. All right. All right. It's probably a good idea since they, all, they are all related. Okay, so what we just got done talking about was the medical portion of retirees. Now this is the pension portion. And before I even get going, this is so much more complicated than what you just got to see. So I will do my best, but um, not, not clear. All right, so the background here, we have a CalPERS pension. CalPERS pension today statewide has about 3,000 employers. Of those employers, we have about 2 million members, meaning employees. Uh, CalPERS is independent. They are not um, uh, contingent upon any of the agencies. They are an independent agency on their own, similar to we are a special district from the county. We're not contingent on the county. Uh, they are the ones that administer the funds. We do not get to tell them where to invest their funds. We just put our money in there, and we trust that they are going to take care of our money and invest it um, Properly, I guess. So CalPERS is responsible for collecting money from the employer, the employee, and that's the contributions that come out of the employee's paychecks and the contributions that we uh, give to CalPERS every month. If you go to 15C2 in the budget, that shows you right there that uh, for 2019, we budgeted about $5.6 million for this contribution for the employer side. Um, in uh, 20, we are $6.2 million. So the main objective here is uh, we put money into CalPERS, the employee puts money into CalPERS, CalPERS takes that money and they invest it, hoping to make money off of that to uh, good investments, similar to your own personal investments, so that you can have money that lasts <clears throat> the lifetime of the employee. That's the, that's the end game here. The gap between the funds that we send them and the funds that they uh, need by agency is our unfunded accrued liability, and that's called the UAL. And again, this is pension only. This came straight out of the CalPERS, um, one of their publications. <coughs> this is historical things that affected uh, the funding that CalPERS had. And uh, many of us remember what happened back when the dot-com crash happened, back in the 2000 area. We also remember what happened with a very, very long recession. And so these are just bullet points of things that happened. SB 400 and SB uh, 616, I think that says. Um, that's when uh, CalPERS in the state of California put in enhancements to the CalPERS programs. So employers had options 
to uh, supplement their current uh, CalPERS pensions with even better. I mean, you have some agencies that have three and a half at 50. Um, you have a lot of fire and police in there that have certain supplementals to the base pension that the uh, entity has. And then one of the biggest things here is on the bottom here, discount uh, rate. Discount rate is basically how much, uh, how much interest you're going to make. So they took it from 8.25, and since 2004, going all the way to 2016, 17, they've dropped that, I'm going to call it interest rate, but it is officially called the discount rate, from 8.25 to 7%. So that's, that's not good. We're making less money on our money. So how do we get here? Um, CalPERS had significant investment losses uh, over multiple years, and that's not just CalPERS. There are a lot of us agencies. We personally do not invest investments, but I know the county does, and there's other entities that do their own investing, and a lot of people lost a lot of money. Um, we did our own kind of investing where we had $26 million in our reserve account, which was not dedicated to anything. And we kept holding on and holding on and spending that reserve and keeping the service on the street, keeping the employees employed. And it just went on too long for everybody, including CalPERS. So uh, their CalPERS contribution policy, um, they were slow, just like a lot of other entities, to recognize that their investments were losing more than they could handle. And so they, on top of that, they had a 30-year amortization instead of a 20 or 15-year amortization. So the longer you amortize something, the longer um, you think you have time to pay things back. It smooths things out theoretically, but it does stretch out the pain. Um, this is what I alluded to before, the enhanced benefit formulas. Those went in in 2001. So that increased the, the um, pull on that account. And then the demographics, I kind of alluded to that before. We have more retirees going. So if you, if you say that the baby boomers from, from 1946 to 1964, you add 50 years to that. So if someone retires at 50, that's a baby boomer, you'd be retiring between 1996 and 2014. If you waited until you were 65, you would start retiring in 2011, and then you would be retiring until 2029. So that kind of gives you the, the um, time frame. And the reason I pick baby boomers is they are still the biggest demographic of all of our employees. So going on to developments that this is how CalPERS is um, put in place to strengthen um, the accounts that they have today. So for us, um, it's bad for us, but it's good for the uh, CalPERS account where they're lowering their discount rate and they're doing this over a three year period of time. Uh, and they're passing that increase off to the employers. So instead of a 7.5% interest rate that they had anticipated getting, they're bringing that down to 7%, and we're expecting the employer to make up that 0.5% difference. Second thing that they're doing is they have reallocated their assets. Um, those of you that have investment accounts, uh, whether it's your retirement account or any other account, uh, you may know something called balancing. And so what they've done is they've rebalanced their accounts. Um, I believe they used to be much, much higher on real estate. That's why they kind of lost their shirts when the dot-com thing went in the hole. I don't know how much they lost, but I know it's a significant amount. So now you see that real estate is only 13%. Global equity, um, I will tell you that the trend is global equity is the place that a lot of people are going. It, it uh, um, spreads out uh, where you're investing instead of only in one or two things, only in real estate, only in utilities, only in certain areas. So they've, they've uh, spread it out between different things. And then they keep only 1% liquid, and that's payments that they have to make. You know, they probably have that in CDs or money markers or things like that. But the majority is in, I'm going to say, mid to low risk um, type of situations. I, in the brief account that I looked at, I didn't see a whole lot of high risk stuff that they have uh, the money invested in. And then the last thing that they're trying to do to shore up the accounts or all of our accounts is going from 30 years to 20 years is a shorter amortization. This is going to take effect um, this year, and it's going to speed up the amount of money that they get in from us, which means we are going to be paying substantially higher um, payments to CalPERS. 
Excuse me, Angela, quick question. Um, could I ask you a question on this particular slide? Um, when we're going from seven and a half to seven, and you said the employer contribution, is this something that's still negotiable between employment and the employees in their contract negotiations on who's going to? This is employer contract. Just the employer, or is this could be a combination of what's negotiated between employee and employer? I'm going to let Debbie help me on this one. Not between the employer and the employee. Can you can you do the mic, please, so that we can all hear you? <laughs> Sorry, um, this is not between. This is not the employee rate. It's not the employer rate. What this is is their anticipated rate of return. Okay. Their investments. And they're on their investments. So they were thinking they were going to get seven and a half, and now they're reducing that. So, uh, meaning this, uh, m taking it to the next step. Since we have to make up the the remainder remainder of this difference, um, that remainder being negotiated between us paying it out of our budget and the employee paying it in terms of what their contract share is. I know that we're doing this with the city of the employee is contributing a bit more to help offset some of this. Um, is that something in conversation as well? So um, that that is an option, I suppose. Um, I can't tell you that we've had conversations about that today. But um, yes, there's many options that can be put forward to figure out how to pay for that extra 0.5%, but we haven't gone down the road of that yet. Thank you. I continue. Okay, so this is one of my favorite slides. Christina put this in here. Oh, and by the way, this is all Christina and Debbie. They, they are the gurus of all of these slides putting this together. So this one, um, I think, speaks to everybody. Everybody knows what a dollar bill was, and it tells you how much um, that one dollar, how CalPERS is using that today. So investment earnings, they are getting about 62% of that dollar. 25% of that is coming from the employers, or 25 cents is coming from the employers, and then 13 is coming from the members themselves. And that's, um, that's how our dollar bill is uh, put together, three different sources. Another complicated, but as simple as we could get it uh, presentation here. So today, CalPERS rate for our payroll, they tell us that they, uh, our cost is 9.2% of our payroll. And so 9.2% is about a million seven. Additionally, we have the UAL, which is $3.6 million. <coughs> Put that together, and you have on the bottom left there $5.3 million. Our budget that I have putting forward on 15C2 is where I get that $5.6 million. This is how it's put together. So co contributions of from the payroll, and we're trying to buy down our uh, unfunded liability between the two, it's $5.6 million. So if you take that information and you move it forward for the next six years, starting in 2020, going through 2025, the percent of our payroll, we think it's gonna go up from 9.4 all the way up to 10.1. If you take that percentage, our unfunded um, liability payment's gonna be 4.1, gonna go up to 5.9. And again, this is all coming out of our operating budget. The projected payroll with that uh, 9.4 or 10.1% is based on is $20 million to $23 million in payroll expenses. And so 30.2% is our um, percent of payroll. And that's where you get your 6.1 all the way up to 8.2 if we keep going the rate at the rate that we're going today. Again, this is strictly a projection. This is not um, anything that's been put out as this is what's going to happen. So the history to our pension, back in 2009, it was $44 million. That was manageable with what we had going on. Dipped down in 2011, and now we're up to 56.5. And this is for the 2018, um, it's always a year behind, so it says 2017 up there, that's when we incurred it, but it, we hit our books in 2018. So in 2018, our unfunded liability for our pension is $57 million. So you put this together, with our OPEB liability, and we're about $165 million is what we need that bucket for. 
So, options. We could prepay the UAO portion, and that's actually an option that I do have in the budget. Um, we are, are looking to prepay it on July 1st, the whole thing for the year, instead of paying it 1 12th every year or every month. And we would save about uh, $144,000. Second option would be uh, putting additional money towards the um, UAL, so paying even more money uh, to pay that down. And the third one is we could take out um, a loan, basically, and put a stake in the ground and start paying off towards that. I know some um, agencies have done that. We do not have uh, significant money to put towards that right now. Uh, that, that would be a huge push to put money towards number three. But uh, number one and number two are something, number two is something we can talk about. Number one, we can absolutely do starting today. Number one is, uh, this is just the uh, schematic of how we're going to do that. We're going to save about $144,000 if we pay $4 million July 1st. That every year, of course, that, that uh, helps us as we go. Second one, payments can be made at a dedicated amount into this account. It allows for us to be flexible at how we budget. We can dedicate it out of one-time money. We don't want to have um, something that, oh, let me stop there. It's one, we, we can dedicate it, it's one-time funding, and we can also use um, new revenue towards this. And the additional payments, obviously that brings our principal down, which means we pay less interest. So this is just an example. If we paid a million dollars uh, today to reduce the amount of interest would be down by about a million six over the over the life of the 30 years We're still doing 30 because it doesn't go down to 20 until this year If we paid a million dollars every year for the next five years We could reduce and save 6.8 million dollars worth of interest over the next 30 years So every time you put more money in you pay less interest And then the third one is the f fresh start. You can either do all of it or a portion, portion of it. If you do all of it, you have to pay um, off the bases faster and you extinguish that uh, amortization schedule. You create a brand new minimum payment, which would be much, much higher. But then you have significant long-term savings. And once you do it, you can't take it back. It's irrevocable. Fresh start, just doing portions of it, you can do... Um, added pieces every year. You can ensure you similar savings, but not as much if you paid the whole thing. And uh, it's not irrevocable. It is irrevocable. So if you did a 20 years amortization, which is starting this year, you could save $12.7 million if we did that. If you did a 15 year amortization, you could save $32 million. But the payments, I think, would be a little much for us to swallow. Questions? Questions? Okay, I'm going to I'm going to have you take a break right there, and let's see if anybody from the public wants to weigh in on either the OPEBs or the uh, pension liabilities. Come on up now. Come on up, yeah. My name is. My name is Rich Gabriel. I am a retired. I am a retiree. I was hired in 1984. At that point, I was not given. Oh, at that point, a lot of us were recruited uh, right out of high school, right out of mechanical technologies, right out of schools, and right out of the middle. Mil, the, excuse me, the military. We were not able to pay into Medicare, and about 1990. I'm, I'm estimating this, is when Medicare started being taken out of further employees out of their pay. Now, there's a gaggle of us that basically have nothing when they hit two, uh, 65 years old. So as we're talking about the medical benefits, these people are really going to be affected. And they're all about my age, which is mid-60s. So um, I'd like to, that to be taken into consideration. Some of them, I, I, I understand that nothing here was saying just drop the whole thing. It was all other ways, and that was very pleasing to me. 
Um, that's better. I, I want to make sure that those people don't get forgotten. It's kind of when you get your thing from Social Security and it just says from 1984 to now is zero. It makes you wonder. Thank you. Thanks for your comments. Welcome. Good morning, board. James Sandoval, General Chairperson of Smart Transportation Local 23. I just want to pass on a message from our international rep, Bonnie Moore. She was unable to stay and she had to run out of here. Uh, we have been informed that this is not a recommendation, but only information. Please understand that we are a pay-as-we-go agency. Our members pay their full share of the employer's contribution, unlike some cities that have run into problems with their employee pension process. We are the transit district, not the city. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments from the public on either of these two presentations? Okay. We'll bring it back uh, for... Uh, those are just presentations, item 14. Comment. Oh, go ahead, Dr. Rockin. Yeah, before you go into 15, right? Okay, yeah. Um, if you follow the news nationally about pension issues, and <coughs> they apply also to uh, retiree medical, although there's not that much discussion about it, but it's the same issue, um, you might get a sense that we're in absolute complete free fall. You know, the Social Security system's bankrupt, we're all going to, nobody will have a retirement or something. And um, <coughs> people are wrong to think, you know, there isn't a problem. You could just forget it. It's, oh, it's all going to work out. Don't, there's not a problem. There is a problem with Social Security. There is a problem with our pension system, with CalPERS and with and retiree medical. Um, on the other hand, nobody can afford, I don't think, I'm amazed to hear some agency did something 10 years ago that fixed it for them. I don't know how they, they must be a very wealthy place where that happened or something because this is a balancing act. If you decide to totally try and fix this problem in the short run, you're going to take it. You wouldn't have a bus system. I mean, you, the only way you could pay for this, John Leopold pointed this out earlier, would be to stop all your operations. You'd have enough money to cover the pension for the people that used to work here, but you'd close down that day. And when often um, political pundits or uh, political actors at the national level talk about, you know, we, 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 we've got to, like, you know, we're – X trillion dollars in debt and around, you know, um, Social Security, these kinds of issues. We need to pay this off. This is a liability. And they, their argument is you should have the money in the bank or in a trust fund to pay as if everybody's going to retire tomorrow afternoon. Well, we're not going to retire. Nobody's retiring tomorrow afternoon. This agency is going to go on for a long time. I think Alex Clifford understated the nature of the problem. It's not a many year, pro it's a many decade problem to solve this issue for us. I think it's really, really a serious one. But I think it would be a mistake to ignore it or think, well, you know, because it's not, you don't have to pay everybody tomorrow afternoon. Well, then it'll work out. But if you look at the numbers that Angela just presented to us, you get a pretty, pretty clear sense that it gets worse every year, not better. And what we need to do at least is sort of have it level out and sort of have the problem sort of eat away at it slowly on some level. And I think that's the responsible thing for us to be doing. So when it comes to our budget decisions, for example, putting aside the $2 million, uh, that's being proposed here, um, it seems to me that um, that's a responsible thing to think about doing. Maybe when we're done with the bu budget process and we look at all of our costs and stuff, it won't be exactly two million. Maybe it'll be—it's not like a magic number of two million, but it's uh, for me, it's in the right range. It's not like we couldn't do five million. At five million, the only way we could do it would be to reduce our employees' wages or cut th a third of our routes or something that would just n be completely unacceptable or raise our our fares. That wouldn't even work because if you raise the fares enough to do this, you'd lose all your riders. So. I think we're on the right track thinking about putting this money aside. I think we're in the ballpark with the numbers that you're talking about in your, in the, they weren't exactly recommendations, but your suggestions of our alternatives. But I, I think we need to <clears throat> not feed the sort of national frenzy that somehow if we don't pay off this liability tomorrow afternoon, we're all, you know, we're all, we're all going to, you know, be, be uh, hell with it in a handbasket or something. It, it, it's not, it's not, it doesn't take that form. It's not a crisis tomorrow afternoon. It's a slow moving wreck. And the way you, you know, we have to somehow start to deal with it now. And I think that's the responsible thing for us to be doing. Um, but uh, more than that, I think uh, it, it's just imperative that we not just ignore this. I think we, and I don't think we ignore this in the sense that we were just irresponsible about it. For example, one of the charts showed that um, the, uh, the benefit plans themselves have been going up over time. Well, when the state um, decided to increase the benefit plans 
particularly for the prison guards is where this whole thing started many years ago. Everybody else was forced to follow. If you were in law enforcement, you know, you lost your possible police officers in your, in your city or if whatever areas you were in, when the state employees, when the state started to have this benefit plan that was so much better than everybody else's, you couldn't keep your employees. They would just, you'd, you'd train them and then they'd go to, go to a state agency where they could get a much better benefit plan. So local governments and transit agencies and water districts were all forced to increase the uh, retirement benefits for their employees in, in light of what the state did. I don't think what the state was necessarily all that responsible, to be honest, at the time. But we had no choice but to follow, I'm thinking now of the city of Santa Cruz particularly, we had no choice but to sort of follow the lead that they had forced us into if, unless we wanted to lose all of our employees. But I think now, we're, I think everybody's in recognition that maybe at this point we can't be increasing these benefits at that level. They Somehow we have to hold the, the line on some of these benefits. and. We do have to balance how much we put aside with what we need to pay our employees decently and what and you know give them a reasonable salary to be even to be recruit them aside from what's just moral and just just effectively you can't hire people if you don't pay them enough to come to work so this is the a balancing act and I just want to say I support the general approach that Alan is, Angela is laying out here starting the process laying some stuff aside figuring out a way to do it that we can afford to do without totally gutting our service or or totally destroying our employees. Any other comments? Director Leopold. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I agree with uh, uh, my colleague, uh, Director Rockin, that it's, it, we, ha we, we would be irresponsible if we didn't look at, at reducing this long-term liability. Um, and how we do it is, is always is, is where um, the details will matter. Um, I know at the county, when we face this problem, uh, uh, 2000. Uh, I, th I think Supervisor McPherson might have been on the on the on the board. So maybe it was 2013. Um, we uh, we worked with our our constituent unions uh, and thought about what the future would look like and managed to come up with a, a series of uh, pieces um, that allowed us to reduce our OPEB by 127 million dollars over 30 years. Um, so it was a it was an effective strategy. It really it really helped us out. And so um, uh, there is a, I, I think we should use this opportunity to engage with our employees to 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 uh, better educate everyone about this and to look at strategies that are a win win because uh, what we did at the county was done in collaboration rather than confrontation and. Uh, I think we can come up with strategies to start bending the curve, <coughs> so we don't we're not looking at those increases. You know, the f the, the always the the first thing is um, you know you want to stop digging the hole, right? Uh, and I think w there's there's part of that that we can do, um, and then work on the long term strategy to uh, 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 to to make it so it's less impactful uh, long term on us. I I think it's there. Uh, and part of that discussion may happen in the finance committee. Part of it might happen in the HR uh, personnel uh, uh, committee as well. And uh, part of it will happen um, in negotiations. And I think that uh, th all those things become uh, important uh, to take on this, this, uh, this problem, which wasn't created yesterday, which is not necessarily uh, a reflection of bad strategies. The strategies that we used are common strategies in which agencies have used for many years. And now with changes in the way in which we must record them, um, uh, we uh, want to make sure that we are actually trying to figure out some way to, to manage these liabilities in a different way than we have in the past. And I think w the, uh, this, uh, this board has shown that it's willing to do that. Um, but there are lots of different uh, pieces, right? I mean, we've, we've heard about the 60-plus buses that we need. We've uh, heard about the... Than that now. What? It's less than Lower 60 that number. We have a new number. <laughs> well, the, the, <laughs> we do have a, 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 a strategy to replace the, the millions of dollars of buses. We know that there's a $200 million capital uh, need uh, that w we'll talk about. Uh, we know that uh, uh, we heard uh, at the last meeting about the starting pay for drivers. We, you know, there, there's, there's all, all these things are important, um, and we're going to have to find that balance. 
uh, for uh, for what gets us into the future um, and keep service on the street and uh, meeting the needs of people in Santa Cruz County. So I look forward to the conversation, and I, I think it's important that we start it. I think I'll use that as a sp – oh, if you have a last comment, go ahead. I'm always ah. curious. Go ahead, Dan. Go ahead. I'm always curious about where we arrive at a particular statistic, and maybe I missed it, but where where did the $2 million come from? I mean, how that, that did we Angela's, arrive at that Angela's number? suggestion of what we might I know, but I mean, based on what? Why $2 million? Why not $1.5 million, $1.75 I think – go ahead, Angela. You can I'll answer that. I'll that in my budget. Pardon me? I'll We're going to get to the budget, budget, and she's going to have that in our next topic. Ah, That's I, I keep a anticipating. Yeah. Okay. I, I'm trying to get that. us there. D Director Northcutt. I want, to, I want to acknowledge the good efforts and the good faith of working this out and trying to um, find ways to uh, deal with this, what, what could potentially become a crisis. I work for one of the agencies that um, pushed the cost of retirement off to the employee. And um, as a union representative at that time, our biggest thing was if you are charging me more to work here than what I'm getting in paycheck and our benefits, as was pointed out, benefits are a part of our our higher packet, our paycheck kind of of, of um, what you calculate as our earnings. And so when you reduce those um, to us and we don't see anything in return, then it's not an agency people tend to want to work for. And when we did have to go back in two thirds uh, 2013, we pushed the benefit, the CalPERS um, portion off onto the employees. We lost a significant amount of employees. At the time, it helped because we couldn't afford the staffing levels that we needed, um, but it was a great disservice to the college to do that because when the cost of living continues to increase but the paycheck remains the same and our decreases because we have to contribute more, um, that's also a balancing act that's worth um, recognizing on the employee side of the table. So I appreciate you taking this time to even evaluate what those efforts and those effects look like. Go ahead, Director. Yeah, and it's not without the conversation with unions because unions have faced this elsewhere on what they've done to work with their employees for the negotiation and keeping it um, an open mind for what they're suggestions or recommendations have been with with the other unions and what they've done to work collaboratively with their employers on um, some of these solutions or some remedies to help this and you're right this is not going to be 100 percent pay down zero balance we know that there will always be a re revolving debt but we just need to make sure that we've got that's something that's realistic and that we can live with and manage so that uh, we don't have um, a collapse I, I certainly don't want to see that happen because it doesn't help employers doesn't help the the community that needs these services and um, I think that everything is being balanced on probably the, the the head of a pin really when it comes down to where we're going to come up with the money and retain our employees and um, do the right thing for this community director Lynn and uh, first of all I appreciate all the work that's gone into this um, by your team because uh, there's a lot of information a lot of options and the UAL is, you know, is the one that seems the easiest that we can we can do that now, and and anything we can do to to uh, to make a savings without really um, stretching us too thin is, you know, no brainer. I think on that. Um, if I had not seen the irre irrevocable trust option, and that's that's a new option, I wasn't real clear. It, is it something that you can put? A small amount, and and uh, I mean, there seems to be some some maybe dangers of being committed, and then getting into a crisis like we were just a few years ago, where you know we were in the red. So um, it well, sounds like there's some danger there. There's pros and cons to it, and so when we go through and have the actuarial do their review, and then our staff does our uh, the review and the recommendations, we would definitely bring the pros and cons back to you about. The different options. If you choose this option, this is the pros of it, this is the cons of it, and so on and so forth. So, And something maybe we can do in a very small uh, measure at first, you know, a cautious measure, I guess, at first maybe, yeah. you know, we'll give to you know minimum, those options. We'll give you the minimum limits. I'm sure there's okay. something like that in there too, but um, we'll bring that back to you when we uh, present uh, our recommendations. Thank you. 
Okay, I'm going to go ahead and move on. Just a quick comment. I, I think what the intent of having these on the agenda today was awareness, and I think that's where we're all sitting right now. Okay, we're keenly aware that we have a dilemma here in Metro that a lot of us share in the counties and cities that we, we all participate in. Uh, and I look forward to the recommendations and the, the work of the Finance Committee because I'm sure that's where this is going to be headed to come back with some, some great dialogue and, and how we can move forward. So uh, with that, I'm going to go ahead and move on to item 15, which is the, uh, the budget, which is where you're going to share a little bit more of the details about what you have planned for us. So go ahead with that presentation. Class is adjourned for the last hour and a half. Now we're going on to the budget. Um, so I have not gone through the detail of the budget before, um, seeing as the time frame, and I know we have some uh, other issues that you want to go over today. Do you want me to go through the detail, or do you just want me to go through the presentation? Because I can hit highlights and go from there. It's up to you. I'm going to, I can make the assumption that you've all read that. I, I think we're going to have a fairly uh, large. I think we have a large uh, closed session. session. So if so you can sure give the synopsis or the cliff notes and get us through that, I think. Uh, but pay attention to the details. I know there were some questions about the specific funding that you had. and, and So include those, but sure. otherwise go through it. Okay. So um, in March, we presented to you our FY2021 operating budget and our FY20 capital budget. Um, that was given to you in detail. And today we're going to be going over our five-year budget plan, which is also our forecast. We do a two-year revolving budget and a three-year forecast. It's going to show you the revenues, the operating budgets, the operating expenses, and the transfers. We'll also be looking at the uh, revenue percent change on uh, revenue expense percent change versus the CPI percent change. Uh, show you the operating budget changes since March, the operating reserve balances that we're projecting, and then going through some risks and then some additional information, and then lastly, our capital budget. On to the five-year um, budget plan or their five-year forecast. The red line shows you our revenues. This is our revenue, I'm sorry, our expenses. The red line is our expenses. Yes. So $52 million in expenses. We always want that line to be below how much revenue we think is coming in. So for FY20, we are anticipating 56, almost $57 million in revenue. The different colors shows you the different kind of revenue that we're expecting. You can go to page 15B1 if you want to see the detail to these revenue um, different colored lines. This is uh, projections for the next five years, the type of revenue that we anticipate coming in. Of course, our biggest one is our two sales taxes. Uh, that is 47% of our operating budget. Second largest one is our passenger fares. Passenger fares is not made up of just the fare box. It's also made up of our three contracts, the Cabrillo contract, the UCSC contract, and the Highway 17 contract that we have for that. And then the third largest one is our TDA money that we receive. Going on to our expense side, uh, this is, in my view, a very pretty picture because we have our expenses below the, reven uh, the revenues. Our revenues, as you guys show up there, we're anticipating about $57 million going up to $63 million, and our expenses in every single year will be below the revenues that we're bringing in. And you can look at the detail of that on 15B1 also. This is our operating expenses projected over the next five years where we think we're going to be spending our money. 35% of it will be spent on the uh, fixed route bus operator space. 40% will be paid on our support personnel, which is the SCIU and the management personnel. And then um, non-personnel expenses are utilities, um, parts for our revenue and non-revenue vehicles, and our fuel. And then our smallest piece is our paratransit labor and fringe. On the transfer side, uh, you can go to 15C6 for the details on this. Our capital reserve fund, uh, that's where we're going to be putting um, the revenues that we have above and beyond the expenses that we have coming in. The blue lines down here, that $2.4 million, that's the percentage of our operating money that we are moving for the buses or our, our equipment replacement. And then we have over here transferred operating and capital reserve fund, the CalPERS, UA, U, UAL, and OPEB. 34% is the green one there. Uh, that's the $2 million that I, we are recommending that we take from the operating budget of the revenues that are above our expenses that we plan on incurring and putting that into a brand new reserve bucket. Might be, this might be a good time to explain where you came up with the two, why $2 million, the question that was asked earlier. Okay. So go to page... Uh, 15C6, packet. Oh, 
on 15 C6, this is our transfer page. And what this shows you is that um, we have to have a zero budget. And so we are going to transfer $5.1 million in our 2020 budget into all these re uh, reserve buckets. So transfer to capital budget. This is uh, $2.3 million of the, th of the th $2.3 million of the $3 million commitment that the board has made to put money towards buses. $2.3 million is operating money and the rest of it is a capital money. And then the rest of it is uh, $300,000 going as the fuel tax credit. That's the one that we never know is coming in, so we never budget for it. We always anticipate throwing it into the reserve. If it actually comes through, yay, we have money in the reserve. If it doesn't, it doesn't affect our operating budget and something doesn't get funded. Um, I'm going to skip down to line five, operating capital reserve fund, $470,000. That is um, the capital fund where we have uh, uh, but, um, projects that we think we're going to be doing. That's where that money comes from, as well as our 20% or whatever percent we're putting towards grants that we're applying for. That's the bucket that that money would come out of. And then lastly, uh, we've chosen $2 million as the number. Uh, the board has every right to tell me a different number if you don't like that one as to how much you would like to be putting into a new reserve bucket called CalPERS, UOA, and OPEP. That's how we came up to the $2 million. If you flip back one page, you will see um, bottom line operating expenses for that same year is $51.5 million. And our revenues on page 15C1 are 56.6. .6. The difference between those is the five million one. So $56 million in revenue, 51, 52 million in expenses. That's how you come up with, 50, with $5 million able to go into the reserve accounts, including the $3 million, uh, the $2.3 million for the buses. So in keeping with the balanced budget, there was that surplus Correct. of $5 million, and then you made the allocations to what we'd already committed to, and that left the delta of the $2 million that you could put into the fund if we, if we so choose. If you so choose, that is correct. Is that clear? Yes. Okay. All right. So total revenue expense percent change. Sorry, lost track of my stuff here. All right. Can I ask a question now that maybe someone has to do some research on while you're still while you're still talking? Could you give us some idea of what the increase uh, has been? Uh, the pie chart that shows uh, paratransit costs, the eight percent, I think. Um, how has how has that changed over time? Is that gone? Is that going up steadily? Is it sort of leveled out? I have no idea. It goes up. But, but at some point, maybe someone would give us a better sense of how, you know, at one point it was when we first started doing paratransit, it was huge, really steep. We sure. started with a small service and got bigger and bigger. Do you want and history of the department itself or history of um, uh, personnel expenses? No, just with the co what does it cost us to run the paratransit system as a sec as a percentage of our budget, and is it going up? Is it taking a bigger chunk of that pie of our total operation operating budget? All right. Um, I can't and tell you how far we're going to go back. Sometime we'll before you're done, maybe someone can tell us that or something. We can bring that for you next time. Okay, that'll be fine. Or I can email it to you, whichever you'd like. What? Would you like me to email it to you? No, I can wait till the next meeting. Okay. Alrighty. So this is the budget um, revenue expense versus the CPI change. So uh, one of the biggest things that you see here is, is in 2018. The total revenue change was 10.3%, and that was when Measure D and SB, um, S, STA, S, STA and SB1 came through. So we budgeted that much. Look at that same line going forward to actual, and it actually came through at 14. So um, we got more on the revenues than we anticipated, but I'm going to flip back here real quick. Look at the CPI. CPI is staying pretty stable with the red line, and then on the actual CPI, the red line again, still pretty stable. Going back again to budget on the expense, the orange line. So in 2019 is when we really tried to uh, pull things together. Actually, we started in 2018 and then we kept things budget-wise in a tight, um, tight circle around the CPI. And if you go forward to the actual, we did pretty good in 17. We actually um, had less expense than we had budgeted. 
and now for 2018, um, the actual that came in came right in around CPI. From a budget and actual perspective, you want to stay around your CPI increases or whatever CPI is. Kind of gives you a good indication of where you are, what, how you're doing as an agency. But these spikes up and down, they're, every single one of them are explainable. We know why we went down. We know why we went up on the expense as well as the um, revenues. And so there's nothing on this chart, even though it looks schizophrenic, that um, is not explainable and we know why we are where we are today. And we're actually in a really good place as of 18, and I think 19 is going to look pretty good too. So the changes between the March presentation and the May presentation, we um, are adding revenues, yay. So we're adding about $138,000 in 20 and 131000 in 21. We do have puts and takes there. Uh, we had some not so good news from Cabrillo. They are, um, were unable to meet the obligation for this fiscal year, but uh, I'm hearing that we've had some negotiations. So over a longer term, I think we got that under control. But for 2020 and 2021, uh, we're going to be reducing the uh, contract, the revenue contract for Cabrillo down by $200,000. Uh, we did get two vendors down at Pacific Station, so that uh, rental income is going to go up from what we thought. We got some new numbers on uh, TDA, and we also got new numbers that brought us down on the FTA and the stick, as well as TDA, STA numbers. We got no numbers on that in January or in March, and those went up significantly. So the net result of all those puts and takes, 138 more in 20 and 131 in 21. On the expense side, uh, we actually brought our expenses down by 126,000 and 44,000 in 20 and 21. Again, there's ups and downs on this. On the unfortunate side, we do have to reduce our FTEs for our fixed route bus operators by two. Uh, we are not laying anybody off. We actually have 12 vacancies right now on the fixed route operator side, so this affects no employee today. So we are unfunding two FTEs going forward into the 2020 budget. We did add a provisional position for admin specialists in the purchasing area, and then we had some savings in the retirement area uh, because we're going to make that one-time payment in July, and so we'll be uh, savings about $144,000. On the non-personnel side, um, we have some increased costs there for security and for some graphic services. Uh, casualty and liability insurance, we sent Debbie to Tal Caltip and she came back with new numbers. So that increased uh, 120000 in 20 and 121000 in 21. I will say that uh, because we have a brand new manager that just started, I'm sure she's going to uh, have some ideas of what she wants to do in the next year. So you'll probably be seeing some change, not significant, but some change into the June budget uh, in the marketing area. That would be the only one that I'm aware of today. And then the transfers, because of all those puts and takes between the expenses and the revenues, we have to make it zero. So we have... Um, Increased going into our transfers, 265 and 20 and 175 and 21. And so those are the buckets that we anticipate putting that money into. Here's our lovely bucket screen. This is the one that uh, as of 510 of 2019, everything is fully funded. I haven't had, been able to say that for quite some time. So that's, that's quite an accomplishment for all of us. And then we had the bottom right that we uh, intentionally do not have a minimum balance on. This is where we used to have the 26 million, and we have 2.3 in there right now. Um, hopefully we can start putting more money into that and start bringing that up so that when the downturn comes again, because we all know it's going to come again one of these days, we will have some money to sustain ourselves. I'm not showing the uh, UAA bucket on here because that's not something that uh, uh, we're putting forward yet. It would mess up our blue screen. It would, it, all the blue, I don't want any red on there. <laughs> yes. So non-controllable operating risks, this is something that, uh, things that are out there that uh, could possibly happen and we feel that there are risks that we want to make sure that all of you know about. Passenger fares, paratransit fares, fluctuation, fluctuation in ridership. We never know uh, what's going to happen with our ridership. We hope it stays pretty stable, but we have seen trends up and trends down. Special transit fares, we did have that situation with the Cabrillo contract. We're trying to kind of stabilize that. And with the UCSC contract, yay, we're moving forward on that one. Depends on the student vote. Uh, well, that's today, Honest. right? <laughs> we're supposed to know by today or Monday. So crossing our fingers on that one. Uh, sales tax, consumer spending. Consumer spending may stall. 
Um, I keep hearing about a whole bunch of other things that are flying out there. You have the national situation going on, so um, that could change any time. Right now we have 4% in our budget for an increase in sales tax year over year. Crossing my fingers that uh, that continues. Federal, always subject to appropriation and reauthorization. Um, if the, those individuals don't want to play nice, then we have to wait for our money. And if uh, things don't go the way that we want them to, we may not get the money that we think we're supposed to be getting in all those buckets. Alternative fuel tax, I kind of alluded to that. We never know if that thing's coming through or not. Every time it gets delayed uh, longer, it has a better opportunity of never showing up. So uh, I think the last one took nine months to show up for that fiscal year. So that's why we always put it in the reserves. If it comes, great. If it doesn't, it doesn't impact our day-to-day -day operations. Some of the people we visited in D.C. suggested it should go away. So that's a real risk there. Oh, well, there you go. Not, I mean, it wasn't reserve. everybody, but yeah. was, that was voice, which was scary. Oh. Moving on to expenses on the CNG and diesel engine failures. Those are always something that we have out there. You know, is mechanical will break, unfortunately. Fuel cost volatility, even though we have contracts in place, we do have that risk. Workers' comp insurance, that's always, you never know what's going to happen with that. We have gone, uh, been very fortunate for many years where we have not had um, significant workers' comp uh, claims, but we do have workers' comp claims. That's the nature of the, some of the work. Medical insurance, um, we just saw something out of CalPERS the other day. There was a news announcement and uh, the, the prices were crazy, and we never know what they're going to be for sure in January. What I've heard is that the board is meeting like the 16th of June or something to adopt those rates, so I may have better information for you, but it won't be in time to change this budget. I think we have a 5% increase right now. Yeah, 5% increase right now for the medical, medical costs in our budget. Aging fleet, um, the longer we keep these buses, the more maintenance they're, and higher cost maintenance. We are diligently um, trying to replace these buses, but even those buses that are being replaced, they're going to have to be maintained. And then changes in unfunded mandates. We never know when there's going to be something coming through that says you have to do this and there's not a dime to go with it. Additional information. Uh, these are things that the board in the past has said they want to support. <coughs> and so instead of sending you six different staff reports, we put it here. If there's something on here that uh, you believe that we should not be doing anymore, please let me know and we will uh, bring it to you in a separate staff report so you can discuss it. But they are recommended by the Finance Committee. They are recommended by the Finance Committee. That is correct. Memberships, this is kind of small uh, administration. They have the bulk of the memberships because um, admin does the memberships for the agency, not just for our department. Finance and customer service, that's where we do uh, memberships for our individual department employees. Same for HR, risk, purchasing, and fleet maintenance. Fleet maintenance actually does um, fleet and facility type uh, stuff, so we have those two together. Board member travel. These are uh, anticipated conferences that we expect and anticipate that the board members to go to. They do not always go to these. Sometimes there are other meetings. That's why we say additional travel on the bottom. And so this is just a overall, uh, so the public knows that uh, these are the conferences that uh, we anticipate our board's going to be going to. Top two are for national, and the middle two are for the state. Oh, yeah. Employee Center programs. Uh, we have some things in admin as well as operations and customer service, and we have one in risk management. Moving on to the capital budget. Uh, Ed? Oh. Is Ed, over here. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. Do you want questions now or at the end of this presentation? You, if you have them now, go ahead. Yeah. Um, on the memberships, I just wanted to uh, raise a question. We are members of the chamber, and I think that's really valuable. Um, Alex comes to those meetings. Um, I just wonder also about considering the business council, which um, is a also very important countywide business organization. They've been so supportive on transportation and housing issues. So I just throw that out for a suggestion. I don't even know what their membership fees are, but, but maybe at the maybe at the next um, finance was the finance meeting before our next meeting or not? I think we just had a meeting, but where will we? June fourteenth. 
Yeah, so maybe at the finance committee meeting you could give us some, That's give a place us some to information bring that up. about Yeah, I, I think on the scale of things it's a trivial amount, but uh, in terms of um, networking and policy support could be really important. Just put it out there. Sorry, if you can yeah. get us the information, it would be helpful yeah. to consider. That would be great at the finance committee. Okay, go ahead. All right. So moving on to capital. Capital budget, you can go to page 15E.142, I guess it is. Uh, 20 cap, this is the projects for $21.4 million. 17.5 of it is going to be for our revenue vehicles. That's 82% of our capital budget. And then construction related projects are listed there also. That's 9.8% of our capital budget. The funding sources that go along with those projects, um, page 15E3, um, transfers. To the operating budget for Measure D, that's uh, $4 million. It's 19%. Our federal grants are over there at 32%. And to go along with the uh, capital budget, you also have your unfunded capital budget. For five years, if you go to page 15F1, we have a five-year summary there. We have about $45 million of unfunded capital projects out there. And then we also have uh, 10 years out there. $210 million of unfunded capital projects. And the detail can be found on 15F-2 through 7. Yeah. Director Northcutt. I want to make a couple of comments um, in regards to the Cabrillo slides. Um, so it has nothing to do with whether or not we want to con continue the contract. We have been looking at um, the needs of our college with uh, declining enrollment and with the changes to our summer registration um, numbers of students and not getting the same level of services as our full you know our fall and our spring and so aligned with that and the need to um, have Metro uh, reduce some of the drivers because they were un you know unstaffed um, Barrow and I were able to work at Barrow I and Michael were able to work on what we thought was a reasonable consideration. And so I wanted to applaud Barrow for his efforts in meeting both the Metro needs and the Cabrillo needs. And in um, response to that, I also want to acknowledge that our ridership for Cabrillo has um, increased over a, a, a about four month period of time. And so our students are wholly um, becoming more reliant on the Metro system. And as the, the more we push it, the more they see the value in it. And so we are going towards that place where Metro will be a part of our um, ways of getting to campus. But at this time, we do have to address what our summer looks like, what reduced enrollment looks like for us. And I um, respect and appreciate the collaboration that Barrow and Cabrillo has had um, in, in addressing all those concerns with both Metro's staffing needs and Cabrillo's ridership. So I just wanted to acknowledge that. We're moving in the right direction. Yeah, Thanks. great. Any other questions? All right, I'll open it up to the pub. Oh. So my ask is that we adopt a resolution setting for a public hearing on June 28th, and we're not adopting the budget today. Okay, great. I'll go ahead and open it up to the public. Anybody wants to uh, weigh in on this year's proposed budget? Seeing none. Move approval of the uh, staff recommendation to set the uh, meeting for our formal budget hearing. I'll second. Okay. June 28th. Then. Motion by Rodkin, Techman by Kaufman Gomez. Any other discussion? Director Matthews. Yeah, I, um, on the capital budget, I, I see $2.1 million for construction. I'm assuming that would... Uh, be related to, um, I know we have a number of capital uh, construction projects, but Pacific Station would be, uh, that would be uh, where that would fall, is that correct? Yes. Yeah, um, that well, is on page 15E, 1 and 2. Yeah, I was looking at 15A26. I'm looking at the pie chart, but <laughs> whatever. Um, uh, I just want to make sure that we... Uh, acknowledge the direction given and uh, that there's a, a urgency about moving on that, um, certainly from the city's part on reaching a decision. Um, well, on Metro's point, point part also reaching a decision. Um, so I just want to make sure that we're, we're covering the initial stage of that. I think that piece of pie is a good faith gesture. Okay, I, I can't help but raise it. No, okay. no, I, I'm, I'm acknowledging that I believe that's what its intent is there to show the good faith that we're moving in that direction. So would that be accurate? Yes. Okay, okay. thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Hang on, Director thank Myers. You. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah. Um, I guess the other we we had this conversation in the finance also, but with the unfunded um, the unfunded capital obviously is is quite significant, and I think we discussed at the um, at the finance committee that sort of looking di digging deeper into that unfunded capital with some more specificity, and of course. Um, Pacific Station being one thing that will we we all hope and believe will come and come to fruition possibly in the next few years, especially with available funding as it is. But we did discuss sort of a digging, maybe doing a little more deeper dive on our unfunded, um, so we could look at the conflicts between the facilities needs and other other. Um, other objectives such as replacement of buses and things like that. I don't know, um, yeah. Alex, if you want to add a little more to that. Sure, ab absolutely. It was an excellent con uh, uh, point to bring up, which is um, capital is not all about buses. There's, there's other things that we own that we have to maintain. And so as a result of that comment, I think what we want to do is start bringing to the capital board capital committee additional discussions about those other things. It, um, as you know, we have completed the Transit Ac uh, Asset Management Plan for the federal government, which was a really good exercise to go through and evaluate every single asset we own and look at what needs to be done to them and when. And so that comes into play, how that integrates with the unfunded $200 million needs to be discussed. Now, the unfunded $200 million includes things like the buses that we have talked about that's a large portion of that and as we presented to the board last month um, we think we're going to get that resolved about the year 2024 maybe sooner if we get some good grants from the federal and state government so that'll help but there's things in there like we envision a south county division like we once had where we could roll buses out from the watsonville area um, that's a vision it's it's in there it contributes to the 200 million may never happen uh, but we wanted to make sure that it was part of the vision as is an expansion of our maintenance facility uh, but there are many other things that are much more urgent now part of that whole discussion too is to make sure that we avoid deferred maintenance wherever as possible wherever possible and that means budgeting in the operating fund as we do a sufficient amount of money to maintain the things that we own so they don't get to a place where we have to make major investments or uh, completely replace them. Your most current example is Pacific Station. Look at, the, look at the study we just completed that says to get this thing back into good condition or decent condition, you need to spend $5.6 million. We shouldn't put ourselves in that position. We need to avoid that uh, at all costs. One final point I would make, and this is more for the public education, when you look at $20 million, $21 million capital, uh, I want to make clear that we're not, we're not budgeting $21 million this year for the capital program. We're not budgeting 50% of our, what we use for operating for the capital program. This is a, a, a continuum, if you will, of prior funding that has yet to be spent down. So, for example, in prior years, we got the money for the five Gillig CNG buses. As you know, you just don't go to the bus lot and pick out a bus and bring it home, right? It takes time to order it and build it and get it to us. This uh, August, July, August, we'll start receiving those Gillig's and that pot will begin to shrink. There's $3.8 million in federal loan funding sitting in there um, that is still on credit for us to use. We're just waiting for another manufacturer to come into the over the road coach market and we'll hopefully place an order and draw down that 3.8 million. So the 21 million comes down, down, down next year. Uh, our Proterras begin arriving, our Proterra electric buses and the pot will come down and down. Then if we get another grant, it'll go back up again. So it's elastic that way rather than a single year contribution. Director Rockton. I just wanted to say for the public in response to Cynthia's question about the Pacific Station that the board did authorize our, our uh, CEO to uh, begin negotiations with the city on this issue. And so that I believe those are underway and hopefully we're going to have some resolution that works for both the city and the transit district and our, all of our uh, patrons and, and customers. Any other questions or comments? With that, we have a motion on the floor. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously, so we'll schedule that public hearing on June 28th. Thank you. All right. Um, let's see. 
Moving on. Brings us to a review of items to be discussed in closed session. Thanks, Chair. Uh, we just have our one labor negotiation update. There will not be any reportable action. Great. So with that, uh, we'll make an announcement for uh, next uh, Metro meeting will be Friday, June 28th at 9 a.m. at the Santa Cruz City Council Chambers. And with that, we'll recess to closed session. Does anybody like to speak to us on an item in closed session before we go? Seeing none, we'll uh, adjourn in the closed session.